Story two of Day and Night Stories by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two The Touch of Pan. One. An idiot, Heber understood, was a person in whom intelligence had been arrested. Instinct acted, but not reason. A lunatic, on the other hand, was someone whose reason had gone awry. The mechanism of the brain was injured. The lunatic was out of relation with his environment. The idiot had merely been delayed en route. Be that as it might, he knew at any rate that a lunatic was not to be listened to, whereas an idiot... Well, the one he fell in love with certainly had the secret of some instinctual knowledge that was not only joy, but a kind of sheer natural joy. Probably it was that sheer natural joy of living that reason argues to be untaught, degraded. In any case, at thirty, he married her instead of the daughter of a duchess he was engaged to. They lead today that happy, natural, vagabond life called idiotic unmindful of that world the majority of reasonable people live only to remember. Though born into an artificial social clique that made it difficult, Heber had always loved the simple things. Nature, especially, meant much to him. He would rather see a woodland misty with bluebells than all the chateaux on the Loire. The thought of a mountain valley in the dawn made his feet lonely in the grandest houses. Yet in these very houses was his home established. Not that he underestimated worldly things, their value was too obvious, but that it was another thing he wanted. Only he did not know precisely what he wanted, until this particular idiot made it plain. Her case was a mild one, possibly, the title bestowed by implication rather than specific mention. Her family did not say that she was imbecile or half-witted, but that she was not all there, they probably did say. Perhaps she saw men as trees walking, perhaps she saw through a glass darkly. Heber, who had met her once or twice, though never yet to speak to, did not analyze her degree of sight, for in him, personally, she woke a secret joy and wonder that almost involved a touch of awe. The part of her that was not all there dwelt in an elsewhere that he longed to know about. He wanted to share it with her. She seemed aware of certain happy and desirable things that reason and too much thinking hide. He just felt this instinctively, without analysis. The values they set upon the prizes of life were similar. Money to her was just stamped metal. Fame, a loud noise of sorts position, nothing. Of people she was aware as a dog or bird might be aware, they were kind or unkind. Her parents, having collected much metal and achieved position, proceeded to make a loud noise of sorts with some success, and since she did not contribute, either by her appearance or her tastes, to their ambitions, they neglected her and made excuses. They were ashamed of her existence. Her father, in particular, justified Nietzsche's shrewd remark that no one with a loud voice can listen to subtle thoughts. She was perhaps sixteen, for though she looked it, eighteen or nineteen was probably more in accord with her birth certificate. Her mother was content, however, that she should dress the lesser age, preferring to tell strangers that she was childish, rather than admit that she was backward. "'You'll never marry at all, child, much less marry as you might,' she said, "'if you go about with that rabid expression on your face. "'That's not the way to catch a nice young man of the sort we get down to stay with us now. "'Many a chorus girl with less than you've got has caught them easily enough. "'Your sister's done well. Why not do the same? "'There's nothing to be shy or frightened about. "'But I'm not shy or frightened, mother. I'm bored. I mean, they bore me.' It made no difference to the girl. She was herself. The bored expression in the eyes, the rabbit, not all their expression, gave place sometimes to another look. Yet not often, nor with anybody. It was this other look that stirred the strange joy in the man who fell in love with her. It is not to be easily described. It was very wonderful. 
whether sixteen or nineteen, she then looked a thousand. The house-party was of that up-to-date kind prevalent in Heber's world. Husbands and wives were not asked together. There was a cynical disregard of the decent, not the stupid, conventions that savoured of abandon, perhaps of decadence. He only went himself in the hope of seeing the backward daughter once again. Her millionaire parents afflicted him, the smart folk tired him. Their peculiar affectation of a special language, their strange belief that they were of importance, their treatment of the servants, their calculated self-indulgence, all jarred upon him more than usual. At bottom he heartily despised the whole vapid set. He felt uncomfortable and out of place. Though not a prig, he abhorred the way these folk believed themselves the climax of fine living. Their open immorality disgusted him, their indiscriminate love-making was merely rather nasty. He watched the very girl he was at last to settle down with, behaving as the tone of the clique expected over her final fling, and bored by the strain of so much modernity, he tried to get away. Tea was long over, the sunset interval invited, he felt hungry for trees and fields that were not self-conscious, and he escaped. The flaming June day was turning chill. Dusk hovered over the ancient house, veiling the pretentious new wing that had been added, and he came across the idiot girl at the bend of the drive, where the birch trees shivered in the evening wind. His heart gave a leap. She was leaning against one of the dreadful statues, it was a satyr, that sprinkled the lawn. Her back was to him. She gazed at a group of broken pine trees in the park beyond. He paused an instant, then went on quickly, while his mind scurried to recall her name. They were within easy speaking range. "'Miss Elizabeth!' he cried, yet not too loudly, lest she might vanish as suddenly as she had appeared. She turned at once. Her eyes and lips were smiling welcome at him without pretense. She showed no surprise. "'You're the first one of the lot who said it properly,' she exclaimed, as he came up. "'Everybody calls me Elizabeth instead of Elspeth. It's idiotic. They don't even take the trouble to get a name right.' "'It is,' he agreed, "'quite idiotic.' He did not correct her. Possibly he had said Elspeth, after all. The names were similar. Her perfectly natural voice was grateful to his ear and soothing. He looked at her all over with an open admiration that she noticed, and without concealment, liked. She was very untidy, the grey stockings on her vigorous legs were torn, her short skirt was splattered with mud. Her nut-brown hair, glossy and plentiful, flew loose about neck and shoulders. In place of the usual belt she had tied a coloured handkerchief round her waist. She wore no hat. What she had been doing to get in such a state, while her parents entertained a distinguished party, he did not know, but it was not difficult to guess. Climbing trees or riding bareback and astride was probably the truth. Yet her dishevelled state became her well, and the welcome in her face delighted him. She remembered him. She was glad. He too was glad, and a sense both happy and reckless stirred in his heart. Like a wild animal, he said, you come out in the dusk. To play with my kind, she answered in a flash, throwing him a glance of invitation that made his blood go dancing. He leaned against the statue a moment, asking himself why this young Cinderella of a parvenu family delighted him when all the London beauties left him cold. There was a lift through his whole being as he watched her, slim and supple, grace shining through the untidy modern garb, almost as though she wore no clothes. He thought of a panther standing upright. Her poise was so alert, one arm upon the marble ledge, one leg bent across the other, the hip-line showing like a bird's curving wing. Wild animal or bird flashed across his mind something untamed and natural. Another second, and she might leap away, or spring into his arms. 
It was a deep, stirring sensation in him that produced the mental picture. Pure and natural, a voice whispered with it in his heart, as surely as they are just the other thing. And the thrill struck with unerring aim at the very root of that unrest he had always known in the state of life to which he was called. She made it natural, clean, and pure. This girl and himself were somehow kin. The primitive thing broke loose in him. In two seconds, while he stood with her beside the vulgar statue, these thoughts passed through his mind. But he did not at first give utterance to any of them. He spoke more formally, although laughter, due to his happiness, lay behind. They haven't asked you to the party, then? or you don't care about it? Which is it? Both, she said, looking fearlessly into his face, but I've been here ten minutes already. Why were you so long? This outspoken honesty was hardly what he expected, yet in another sense he was not surprised. Her eyes were very penetrating, very innocent, very frank. He felt her as clean and sweet as some young fawn that asks plainly to be stroked and fondled. He told the truth. I couldn't get away before. I had to play about, and— When she interrupted with impatience, They don't really want you, she exclaimed scornfully. I do. And before he could choose one out of the several answers that rushed into his mind, she nudged him with her foot, holding it out a little, so that he saw the shoelace was unfastened. She nodded her head towards it, and pulled her skirt up half an inch, as he at once stooped down. And anyhow, she went on, as he fumbled with the lace, touching her ankle with his hand, you're going to marry one of them. I read it in the paper. It's idiotic. You'll be miserable. The blood rushed to his head, but whether owing to his stooping or to something else, he could not say. I only came. I only accepted, he said quickly, because I wanted to see you again. Of course. I made mother ask you. He did an impulsive thing. Kneeling as he was, he bent his head a little lower, and suddenly kissed the soft grey stocking, then stood up and looked her in the face. She was laughing happily, no sign of embarrassment in her anywhere, no trace of outraged modesty. She just looked very pleased. "'I've tied a knot that won't come undone in a hurry,' he began then stopped dead, for as he said it, gazing into her smiling face, another expression looked forth at him from the two big eyes of Hazel. Something rushed from his heart to meet it. It may have been that playful kiss, it may have been the way she took it, but at any rate there was a strength in the new emotion that made him unsure of who he was and whom he looked at. He forgot the place, the time, his own identity, and hers. The lawn swept from beneath his feet, the English sunset with it. He forgot his host and hostess, his fellow guests, even his father's name, and his own into the bargain. He was carried away upon a great tide, the girl always beside him. He left the shoreline in the distance, already half forgotten, the shoreline of his education, learning, manners, social point of view everything to which his father had most carefully brought him up as a scion of an old established english family this girl had torn up the anchor only the anchor had previously been loosened a little by his own unconscious and restless efforts where was she taking him to upon what island would they land I'm younger than you, a good deal, she broke in upon his rushing mood, but that doesn't matter a bit, does it? We're about the same age, really. With the happy sound of her voice, the extraordinary sensation passed, or rather, it became normal. But that it had lasted an appreciable time was proved by the fact that they had left the statue on the lawn, the house was no longer visible behind them, and they were walking side by side between the massive rhododendron clumps. They brought up against a five-barred gate into the park. They leaned upon the topmost bar, and he felt her shoulder touching his, edging into it, as they looked across to the grove of pines. I feel absurdly young, he said, without a sign of affectation, and yet I've been looking for you a thousand years and more. The afterglow lit up her face. 
It fell on her loose hair and tumbled blouse, turning them amber. She looked not only soft and comely, but extraordinarily beautiful. The strange expression haunted the deep eyes again, the lips were a little parted, the young breast heaving slightly, joy and excitement in her whole presentment. And as he watched her, he knew that all he had just felt was due to her close presence, to her atmosphere, her perfume, her physical warmth and vigor. It had emanated directly from her being. Of course, she said, and laughed so that he felt her breath upon his face. He bent lower to bring his own on a level, gazing straight into her eyes that were fixed upon the field beyond. They were clear and luminous as pools of water, and in their center, sharp as a photograph, he saw the reflection of the pine grove, perhaps a hundred yards away. With detailed accuracy he saw it empty and motionless in the glimmering june dusk then something caught his eye he examined the picture more closely he drew slightly nearer he almost touched her face with his own forgetting for a moment whose were the eyes that served him for a mirror for looking intently thus it seemed to him that there was a movement a passing to and fro a stirring as of figures among the trees then suddenly the entire picture was obliterated. She had dropped her lids. He heard her speaking. The warm breath was again upon his face. In the heart of that wood dwell I. His heart gave another leap, more violent than the first, for the wonder and beauty of the sentence caught him like a spell. There was a lilt and rhythm in the words that made it poetry. She laid emphasis upon the pronoun and the nouns. It seemed the last line of some delicious runic verse, In the heart of the wood dwell I. And it flashed across him, that living, moving, inhabited pine wood was her thought. It was thus she saw it. Her nature flung back to a life she understood, a life that needed, claimed her. The ostentatious and artificial values that surrounded her she denied, even as the distinguished house-party of her ambitious, masquerading family neglected her. Of course she was unnoticed by them, just as a swallow or a wild rose were unnoticed. He knew her secret then, for she had told it to him. It was his own secret, too. They were akin, as the birds and animals were akin. They belonged together in some free and open life, natural, wild, untamed. That unhampered life was flowing about them now, rising, beating with delicious tumult in her veins and his, yet innocent as the sunlight and the wind, because it was as freely recognized. Elspeth, he cried, come, take me with you. We'll go at once. Come, hurry, before we forget to be happy, or remember to be wise again. His words stopped halfway towards completion, for a perfume floated past him, born of the summer dusk, perhaps, yet sweet with a penetrating magic that made his senses reel with some remembered joy. No flower, no scented garden bush delivered it. It was the perfume of young, spendthrift life, sweet with the purity that reason had not yet stained. The girl moved closer, gathering her loose hair between her fingers. She brushed his cheeks and eyes with it, her slim, warm body pressing against him as she leaned over laughingly. In the darkness, she whispered in his ear, when the moon puts the house upon the statue. And he understood. Her world lay behind the vulgar, staring day. He turned. He heard the flutter of skirts, just caught the gray stockings, swift and light, as they flew behind the rhododendron masses, and she was gone. He stood a long time, leaning upon the five-barred gate. It was the dressing-gong that recalled him at length to what seemed the present. By the conservatory door, as he went slowly in, he met his distinguished cousin, who was helping the girl he himself was to marry to enjoy her final fling. He looked at his cousin. He realized suddenly that he was merely vicious. 
there was no sun and wind no flowers there was depravity only lust instead of laughter excitement in place of happiness it was calculated not spontaneous his mind was in it without joy it was he was not natural not a girl in the whole lot fit to look at he exclaimed with peevish boredom excusing himself stupidly for his illicit conduct i'm off in the morning he shrugged his blue-blooded shoulders these millionaires their shootings all right but their mixum gatherum weekends bah his gesture completed all he had to say about this one in particular he glanced sharply nastily at his companion you look as if you found something he added with a suggestive grin or have you seen the ghost that was paid for with the house and he guffawed and let his eyeglass drop lady hermione will be asking for an explanation eh huh? idiot replied haber and ran upstairs to dress for dinner but the word was wrong he remembered as he closed his door it was lunatic he had meant to say yet something more as well he saw the smart modern philanderer somehow as a beast two it was nearly midnight when he went up to bed after an evening of intolerable amusement the abandoned moral attitude the common rudeness the contempt of all others but themselves the ugly jests the horseplay of tasteless minds that passed for gaiety above all the shamelessness of the women that behind the cover of fine breeding aped emancipation afflicted him to a boredom that touched desperation he understood now with a clarity unknown before as with his cousin so with these they took life he saw with a brazen effrontery they thought was freedom while yet it was life that they denied he felt vampired and degraded spontaneity went out of him the fact that the geography of bedrooms was studied openly seemed an affirmation of vice that sickened him their ways were nauseous merely he escaped unnoticed he locked his door, went to the open window, and looked out into the night, then started. For silver dressed the lawn and park, the shadow of the building lay dark across the elaborate garden, and the moon, he noticed, was just high enough to put the house upon the statue. The chimney stacks edged the pedestal precisely. Odd, he exclaimed, odd that I should come at the very moment then smiled as he realized how his proposed adventure would be misinterpreted its natural innocence and spirit ruined if he were seen and some one would be sure to see me on a night like this there are couples still hanging about in the garden and he glanced at the shrubberies and secret paths that seemed to float upon the warm june air like islands he stood for a moment framed in the glare of the electric light then turned back into the room and at that instant a low sound like a bird call rose from the lawn below it was soft and fluty as though someone played two notes upon a reed a piping sound he had been seen and she was waiting for him before he knew it he had made an answering call of oddly similar kind then switched the light out Three minutes later, dressed in simpler clothes, with a cap pulled over his eyes, he reached the back lawn by means of the conservatory and the billiard room. He paused a moment to look about him. There was no one, although the lights were still ablaze. I am an idiot, he chuckled to himself. I'm acting on instinct. He ran. The sweet night air bathed him from head to foot. There was strength and cleansing in it. The lawn shone wet with dew. He could almost smell the perfume of the stars. The fumes of wine, cigars, and artificial scent were left behind, the atmosphere exhaled by civilization, by heavy thoughts, by bodies overdressed, unwisely stimulated, all, all forgotten. He passed into a world of magical enchantment. The hush of the open sky came down. 
in black and white the garden lay brimmed full with beauty shot by the ancient silver of the moon spangled with the star's old gold and the night wind rustled in the rhododendron masses as he flew between them in a moment he was beside the statue engulfed now by the shadow of the building and the girl detached herself silently from the blur of darkness two arms were flung about his neck a shower of soft hair fell on his cheek with a heady scent of earth and leaves and grass and the same instant they were away together at full speed towards the pine wood their feet were soundless on the soaking grass they went so swiftly that they made a whir of following wind that blew her hair across his eyes and the sudden contrast caused a shock that put a blank perhaps upon his mind so that he lost the standard of remembered things for it was no longer merely a particular adventure it seemed a habit and a natural joy resumed it was not new he knew the momentum of an accustomed happiness mislaid it may be but certainly familiar they sped across the gravel paths that intersected the well-groomed lawn they leaped the flower-beds so laboriously shaped in mockery they clambered over the ornamental iron railings scorning the easier five-barred gate into the park the longer grass then shook the dew in soaking showers against his knees he stooped as though in some foolish effort to turn up something then realized that his legs of course were bare her garment was already high and free for she too was bare-legged like himself he saw her little ankles wet and shining in the moonlight and flinging himself down he kissed them happily plunging his face into the dripping perfumed grass her ringing laughter mingled with his own as she stooped beside him the same instant her hair hung in a silver cloud her eyes gleamed through its curtain into his then suddenly she soaked her hands in the heavy dew and passed them over his face with a softness that was like the touch of some scented southern wind now you are anointed with the night she cried no one will know you you are forgotten of the world kiss me we'll play forever and ever he cried the eternal game that was old when the world was yet young and lifting her in his arms he kissed her eyes and lips there was some natural bliss of song and dance and laughter in his heart an elemental bliss that caught them together as wind and sunlight catch the branches of a tree she leaped from the ground to meet his swinging arms he ran with her then tossed her off and caught her neatly as she fell evading a second capture she danced ahead holding out one shining arm that he might follow hand in hand they raced on together through the clean summer moonlight yet there remained a smooth softness as of fur against his neck and shoulders and he saw then that she wore skins of tawny colour that clung to her body closely that he wore them too and that her skin like his own was of a sweet dusky brown then pulling her towards him he stared into her face she suffered the close gaze a second but no longer for with a burst of sparkling laughter again she leaped into his arms and before he shook her free she had pulled and tweaked the two small horns that hid in the thick curly hair behind and just above the ears and that wilful tweaking turned him wild and reckless that touch ran down him deep into the mothering earth he leaped and ran and sang with a great laughing sound the wine of eternal youth flushed all his veins with joy and the old old world was young again with every impulse of natural happiness intensified with the earth's own foaming tide of life from head to foot he tingled with the delight of spring prodigal with creative power of course he could fly the bushes and fling wild across the open of course the wind and moonlight fitted close and soft about him like a skin of course he had youth and beauty for playmates with dancing laughter singing and a thousand kisses for he and she were natural once again 
they were free together of those long-forgotten days when pan leaped through the roses in the month of june with the girl swaying this way and that upon his shoulders tweaking his horns with mischief and desire hanging her flying hair before his eyes then bending swiftly over again to lift it he danced to join the rest of their companions in the little moonlit grove of pines beyond three they rose somewhat pointed, perhaps, against the moonlight, those English pines, more with the shape of cypresses, some might have thought. A stream gushed down between their roots, there were mossy ferns and rough grey boulders with lichen on them, but there was no dimness, for the silver of the moon sprinkled freely through the branches like the faint sunlight that it really was, and the air ran out to meet them with a heady fragrance that was wiser far than wine. The girl, in an instant, was whirled from her perch on his shoulder and caught by a dozen arms that bore her into the heart of the jolly, careless throng. Whish! Whoo! Whirr! She was gone, but another, fairer still, was in her place, with skins as soft and knees that clung as tightly. Her eyes were liquid amber, grapes hung between her little breasts, her arms entwined about him, smoother than marble, and as cool. She had a crystal laugh. But he flung her off, so that she fell plump among a group of bigger figures, lolling against a twisted root, and roaring with a jollity that boomed like wind through the chorus of a song. They seized her, kissed her, then sent her flying. They were happier with their glad singing. They held stone goblets, red and foaming, in their broad-palmed hands. "'The mountains lie behind us,' cried a figure dancing past. "'We are come at last into our valley of delight. Grapes, breasts, and rich red lips. Ho, ho, it is time to press them that the juice of life may run.' He waved a cluster of ferns across the air, and vanished amid a cloud of song and laughter. "'It is ours. Use it,' answered a deep, ringing voice. "'The valleys are our own. No climbing now.' And a wind of echoing cries gave answer from all sides. "'Life! Life! Life! Abundant, flowing over! Use it! Use it!' A troop of nymphs rushed forth escaped from clustering arms and lips they yet openly desired. He chased them in and out among the waving branches, while she who had brought him ever followed, and sped past him and away again. He caught three gleaming soft brown bodies, then fell beneath them, smothered, bubbling with joyous laughter, next freed himself, and while they sought to drag him captive again, escaped and raced with a leap upon a slimmer, sweeter outline that swung up, only just in time, upon a lower bough, whence she leaned down above him with hanging net of hair and merry eyes. A few feet beyond his reach she laughed and teased him, the one who had brought him in, the one he ever sought, and who forever sought him, too. It became a riotous glory of wild children who romped and played with an impassioned glee beneath the moon. For the world was young, and they, her happy offspring, glowed with the life she poured so freely into them. All intermingled, the laughing voices rose into a foam of song that broke against the stars. The difficult mountains had been climbed and were forgotten. Good! Then enjoy the luxuriant, fruitful valley and be glad. And glad they were, brimful with spontaneous energy, natural as birds and animals that obeyed the big, deep rhythm of a simple age, natural as wind and innocent as sunshine. Yet for all the untamed riot there was a lift of beauty pulsing underneath. Even when the wildest abandon approached the heat of orgy, when the recklessness appeared excess, there hid that marvellous touch of loveliness which makes the natural sacred. There was coherence, purpose, the fulfilling of an exquisite law. There was worship. 
The form it took, haply, was strange as well as riotous, yet in its strangeness dreamed innocence and purity, and in its very riot flamed that spirit which is divine. For he found himself at length beside her once again, breathless and panting, her sweet brown limbs aglow from the excitement of escape denied, eyes shining like a blaze of stars, and pulses beating with tumultuous life helpless and yielding against the strength that pinned her down between the roots. His eyes put mastery on her own. She looked up into his face, obedient, happy, soft with love, surrendered with the same delicious abandon that had swept her for a moment into other arms. "'You caught me in the end,' she sighed. "'I only played a while.' "'I told you forever,' he replied, half wondering at the rough power in his voice. It was here the hush of worship stole upon her little face, into her obedient eyes, about her parted lips. She ceased her willful struggling. "'Listen,' she whispered, "'I hear a step upon the glades beyond. The iris and the lily open. The earth is ready, waiting. We must be ready, too.' He is coming. He released her and sprang up. The entire company rose, too. All stood, all bowed the head. There was an instant's subtle panic, but it was the panic of reverent awe that preludes a descent of deity. For a wind passed through the branches with a sound that is the oldest in the world, and so the youngest. Above it there rose the shrill, faint piping of a little reed. Only the first true sounds were audible, wind and water, the tinkling of the dewdrops as they fell, the murmur of the trees against the air. This was the piping that they heard, and in the hush the stars bent down to hear, the riot paused, the orgy passed and died. The figures waited, kneeling then with one accord. They listened with the earth. He comes, he comes! the valley breathed about them. There was a footfall from far away, treading across a world unruined and unstained. It fell with the wind and water, sweetening the valley into life as it approached. Across the rivers and forests it came gently, tenderly, but swiftly and with a power that knew majesty. He comes, he comes, rose with the murmur of the wind and water from the host of lowered heads. The footfall came nearer, treading a world grown soft with worship. It reached the grove. It entered. There was a sense of intolerable loveliness, of brimming life, of rapture. The thousand faces lifted like a cloud. They heard the piping close, and so he came. But he came with blessing. With a stupendous presence there was joy, the joy of abundant natural life, pure as the sunlight and the wind. He passed among them. There was great movement, as of a forest shaking, as of deep water falling, as of a cornfield swaying to the wind, yet gentle as of a harebell shedding its burden of dew that it has held too long because of love. He passed among them, touching every head. The great hand swept with tenderness each face, lingered a moment on each beating heart. There was sweetness, peace, and loveliness, but above all there was life. He sanctioned every natural joy in them and blessed each passion with his power of creation. Yet each one saw him differently, some as a wife or maiden desired with fire some as a youth or stalwart husband, others as a figure veiled with stars or cloaked in luminous mist, hardly attainable. Others again, the fewest of these, not more than two or three, as that mysterious wonder which tempts the heart away from known familiar sweetness into a wilderness of undecipherable magic without flesh and blood. To two, in particular, he came so near that they could feel his breath of hills and fields upon their eyes. He touched them with both mighty hands. He stroked the marble breasts. He felt the little hidden horns, and, as they bent lower so that their lips met together for an instant, he took her arms and twined them upon the curved brown neck 
that she might hold him closer still. Again a footfall sounded far away upon an unruined world, and he was gone, back into the wind and water whence he came. The thousand faces lifted, all stood up, the hush of worship still among them. There was a quiet as of the dawn. The piping floated over woods and fields, fading into silence. All looked at one another, and then once more the laughter and the play broke loose. 4. We'll go, she cried, and peep upon that other world, where life hangs like a prison on their eyes. And in a moment they were across the soaking grass, the lawn and flower beds, and close to the walls of the heavy mansion. He peered in through a window, lifting her up to peer in with him. He recognized the world to which outwardly he belonged. He understood. A little gasp escaped him, and a slight shiver ran down the girl's body into his own. She turned her eyes away. See, she murmured in his ear, it's ugly. It's not natural. They feel guilty and ashamed. There is no innocence. She saw the men. It was the women that he saw chiefly lolling ungracefully with a kind of boldness that asserted independence the women smoked their cigarettes with an air of invitation they sought to conceal and yet showed plainly he saw his familiar world in nakedness their backs were bare for all the elaborate clothes they wore they hung their breasts uncleanly in their eyes shone light that had never known the open sun Hoping they were alluring and desirable, they feigned a guilty ignorance of that hope. They all pretended. Instead of wind and dew upon their hair, he saw flowers grown artificially to ape wild beauty, tresses without luster borrowed from the slums of city factories. He watched them maneuvering with the men, heard dark sentences, caught gestures half-delivered whose meaning should just convey that glimpse of guilt they deemed to increase pleasure. The women were calculating, but nowhere glad, the men experienced, but nowhere joyous. Pretended innocence lay cloaked with a veil of something that whispered secretly, clandestine, ashamed, yet with a brazen air that laid mockery instead of sunshine in their smiles. Vice masqueraded in the ugly shape of pleasure. Beauty was degraded into calculated tricks. They were not natural. They knew not joy. The forward ones, the civilized, she laughed in his ear, tweaking his horns with energy. We are the backward. Unclean, he muttered, recalling a catchword of the world he gazed upon. They were civilized, they were refined and educated, advanced, generations of careful breeding, mate cautiously selecting mate, laid the polish of caste upon their hands and faces, where gleamed ridiculous untaught jewels, rings, bracelets, necklaces, hanging absurdly from every possible angle. But they are dressed up, for fun he exclaimed, more to himself than to the girl in skins who clung to his shoulders with her bare arms. Undressed, she answered, putting her brown hand in play across his eyes, only they have forgotten even that. And another shiver passed through her into him. He turned and hid his face against the soft skins that touched his cheek. He kissed her body. Seizing his horns, she pressed him to her, laughing happily. Look, she whispered, raising her head again, they're coming out. And he saw that two of them, a man and a girl, with an interchange of secret glances, had stolen from the room and were already by the door of the conservatory that led into the garden. It was his wife-to-be, and his distinguished cousin. Oh, Pan, she cried in mischief. The girl sprang from his arms and pointed. We will follow them. We will put natural life into their little veins. Or panic terror, he answered, catching the yellow panther's skin and following her swiftly round the building. He kept in the shadow, though she ran full into the blaze of moonlight. 
"'But they can't see us,' she called, looking over her shoulder a moment. "'They can only feel our presence, perhaps.' And as she danced across the lawn, it seemed a moonbeam slipped from a sapling birch-tree that the wind curved earthwards, then tossed back against the sky." Keeping just ahead, they led the pair, by methods known instinctively to elemental blood, yet not translatable, led them towards the little grove of waiting pines. The night wind murmured in the branches. A bird woke into a sudden burst of song. These sounds were plainly audible, but four little pointed ears caught other, wilder notes behind the wind and music of the bird, the cries and ringing laughter, the leaping footsteps and the happy singing of their merry kin within the wood. And the throng paused then amid the revels to watch the civilized draw near. They presently reached the trees, halted, looked about them, hesitated a moment, then, with a hurried movement as of shame and fear, lest they be caught, entered the zone of shadow. "'Let's go in here,' said the man, without music in his voice. "'It's dry on the pine-needles, and we can't be seen.' He led the way, she picked up her skirts, and followed over the strip of long, wet grass. "'Here's a log all ready for us,' he added, sat down, and drew her into his arms with a sigh of satisfaction. "'Sit on my knee. It's warmer for your pretty figure.' He chuckled. Evidently they were on familiar terms, for though she hesitated, pretending to be coy, there was no real resistance in her, and she allowed the ungraceful roughness. "'But are we quite safe? Are you sure?' she asked between his kisses. "'What does it matter, even if we're not?' he replied, establishing her more securely on his knees. "'But, as a matter of fact, we're safer here than in my own house.' He kissed her hungrily. "'By Jove, Hermione, but you're divine!' he cried passionately. "'Divinely beautiful! I love you with every atom of my being, with my soul!' "'Oh, yes, dear, I know. I mean, I know you do, but—' "'But what?' he asked impatiently. "'Those detectives!' he laughed, yet it seemed to annoy him. "'My wife is a beast, isn't she, to have me watched like that?' he said quickly. "'They're everywhere,' she replied, a sudden hush in her tone. She looked at the encircling trees a moment, then added bitterly, "'I hate her, simply hate her!' "'I love you,' he cried, crushing her to him. "'That's all that matters now.' Don't let's waste time talking about the rest. She contrived to shudder and hid her face against his coat, while he showered kisses on her neck and hair. And the solemn pine trees watched them, the silvery moonlight fell on their faces, the scent of new mown hay went floating past. I love you with my very soul, he repeated with intense conviction. I'd do anything, give up anything, bear anything, just to give you a moment's happiness. I swear it before God. There was a faint sound among the trees behind them, and the girl sat up, alert. She would have scrambled to her feet, but that he held her tight. What the devil's the matter with you tonight? he asked in a different tone, his vexation plainly audible. You're as nervy as if you were being watched instead of me. She paused before she answered, her finger on her lip. Then she said slowly, hushing her voice a little, "'Watched? That's exactly what I did feel. I felt it ever since we came into the wood.' "'Nonsense, Hermione. It's too many cigarettes.' He drew her back into his arms, forcing her head up so that he could kiss her better. "'I suppose it is nonsense,' she said, smiling. "'It's gone now, anyhow.' He began admiring her hair, her dress, her shoes, her pretty ankle, while she resisted in a way that proved her practice. "'It's not me you love,' she pouted, yet drinking in his praise. She listened to his repeated assurance that he loved her with his soul and was prepared for any sacrifice. "'I feel so safe with you,' she murmured, knowing the moves in the game as well as he did. She looked up guiltily into his face, and he looked down with a passion that he thought perhaps was joy. 
"'You'll be married before the summer's out,' he said, "'and all the thrill and excitement will be over. "'Poor Hermione!' She lay back in his arms, drawing his face down with both hands, and kissing him on the lips. "'You'll have more of him than you can do with, eh? Huh? "'As much as you care about, anyhow.' "'I shall be much more free,' she whispered. "'Things will be easier, and I've got to marry someone.' She broke off with another start. There was a sound again behind them. The man heard nothing. The blood in his temples pulsed too loudly, doubtless. "'Well, what is it this time?' he asked sharply. She was peering into the wood, where the patches of dark shadow and moonlit spaces made odd, irregular patterns in the air. A low branch waved slightly in the wind. "'Did you hear that?' she asked nervously. "'Wind,' he replied, annoyed that her change of mood disturbed his pleasure. "'But something moved.' only a branch we're quite alone quite safe i tell you and there was a rasping sound in his voice as he said it don't be so imaginative i can take care of you she sprang up the moonlight caught her figure revealing its exquisite young curves beneath the smother of the costly clothing her hair had dropped a little in the struggle the man eyed her eagerly, making a quick, impatient gesture towards her, then stopped abruptly. He saw the terror in her eyes. "'Oh, hark! What's that?' she whispered in a startled voice. She put her finger up. "'Oh, let's go back. I don't like this wood. I'm frightened.' "'Rubbish!' he said, and tried to catch her by the waist. "'It's safer in the house, my room or yours.' She broke off again. "'There it is. Don't you hear? It's a footstep.' Her face was whiter than the moon. "'I tell you, it's the wind and the branches,' he repeated gruffly. "'Oh, come on, do. We were just getting jolly together. There's nothing to be afraid of. Can't you believe me?' He tried to pull her down upon his knee again with force. His face wore an unpleasant expression that was half leer, half grin. But the girl stood away from him. She continued to peer nervously about her. She listened. "'You give me the creeps!' he exclaimed crossly, clawing at her waist again with passionate eagerness that now betrayed exasperation. His disappointment turned him coarse. The girl made a quick movement of escape, turning so as to look in every direction. She gave a little scream. "'That was a step! Oh, oh, it's close beside us! I heard it! We're being watched!' she cried in terror. She darted towards him, then shrank back. He did not try to touch her this time. "'Moonshine,' he growled. "'You've spoilt my—spoilt our chance with your silly nerves.' But she did not hear him, apparently. She stood there, shivering as with sudden cold. "'There! I saw it again! I'm sure of it! Something went past me through the air!' And the man, still thinking only of his own pleasure, frustrated, got up heavily, something like anger in his eyes. "'All right,' he said testily. "'If you're going to make a fuss, we'd better go. The house is safer, possibly, as you say. You know my room. Come along.' Even that risk he would not take. He loved her with his soul. They crept stealthily out of the wood, the girl slightly in front of him, casting frightened backward glances. Afraid, guilty, ashamed, with an air as though they had been detected, they stole back towards the garden and the house, and disappeared from view. And a wind, rose suddenly with a rushing sound, poured through the wood as though to cleanse it, swept out the artificial scent and trace of shame, and brought back again the song, the laughter, and the happy revels. It roared across the park, it shook the windows of the house, then sank away as quickly as it came. The trees stood motionless again, guarding their secret in the clean, sweet moonlight that held the world in dream until the dawn stole up and sunshine took the earth with joy. End of Story 2「Story Two of Day and Night Stories by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story Two 
THE TOUCH OF PAN One. An idiot, Heber understood, was a person in whom intelligence had been arrested, instinct acted, but not reason. A lunatic, on the other hand, was someone whose reason had gone awry, the mechanism of the brain was injured. The lunatic was out of relation with his environment, the idiot had merely been delayed en route. Be that as it might, he knew at any rate that a lunatic was not to be listened to, whereas an idiot, well, the one he fell in love with, certainly had the secret of some instinctual knowledge that was not only joy, but a kind of sheer natural joy. Probably it was that sheer natural joy of living that reason argues to be untaught, degraded. In any case, at thirty, he married her instead of the daughter of a duchess he was engaged to. They lead today that happy, natural, vagabond life called idiotic, unmindful of that world the majority of reasonable people live only to remember. Though born into an artificial social clique that made it difficult, Heber had always loved the simple things. Nature, especially, meant much to him. He would rather see a woodland misty with bluebells than all the chateaux on the Loire. The thought of a mountain valley in the dawn made his feet lonely in the grandest houses. Yet in these very houses was his home established. Not that he underestimated worldly things, their value was too obvious, but that it was another thing he wanted. Only he did not know precisely what he wanted, until this particular idiot made it plain. Her case was a mild one, possibly, the title bestowed by implication rather than specific mention. Her family did not say that she was imbecile or half-witted, but that she was not all there, they probably did say. Perhaps she saw men as trees walking, perhaps she saw through a glass darkly. Heber, who had met her once or twice, though never yet to speak to, did not analyze her degree of sight, for in him, personally, she woke a secret joy and wonder that almost involved a touch of awe. The part of her that was not all there dwelt in an elsewhere that he longed to know about. He wanted to share it with her. She seemed aware of certain happy and desirable things that reason and too much thinking hide. He just felt this instinctively, without analysis. The values they set upon the prizes of life were similar. Money to her was just stamped metal. Fame, a loud noise of sorts. Position, nothing. Of people she was aware as a dog or bird might be aware, they were kind or unkind. Her parents, having collected much metal and achieved position, proceeded to make a loud noise of sorts with some success, and since she did not contribute, either by her appearance or her tastes, to their ambitions, they neglected her and made excuses. They were ashamed of her existence. Her father, in particular, justified Nietzsche's shrewd remark that no one with a loud voice can listen to subtle thoughts. She was perhaps sixteen, for though she looked it, eighteen or nineteen was probably more in accord with her birth certificate. Her mother was content, however, that she should dress the lesser age, preferring to tell strangers that she was childish, rather than admit that she was backward. "'You'll never marry at all, child, much less marry as you might,' she said, "'if you go about with that rabid expression on your face. That's not the way to catch a nice young man of the sort we get down to stay with us now. Many a chorus girl with less than you've got has caught them easily enough. Your sister's done well. Why not do the same? There's nothing to be shy or frightened about. But I'm not shy or frightened, mother. I'm bored. I mean, they bore me. It made no difference to the girl. She was herself. The bored expression in the eyes, the rabbit, not all their expression, gave place sometimes to another look, yet not often, nor with anybody. It was this other look that stirred the strange joy in the man who fell in love with her. It is not to be easily described. It was very wonderful. Whether sixteen or nineteen, she then looked a thousand. The house-party was of that up-to-date kind prevalent in Heber's world. 
Husbands and wives were not asked together. There was a cynical disregard of the decent, not the stupid, conventions that savoured of abandon, perhaps of decadence. He only went himself in the hope of seeing the backward daughter 